as you remember from Monday, I hope, uh, a lot of what we do here is essentially just uh, just sort of a, a physics, advanced physics one, except that we take into account a lot more instances where the acceleration isn't constant. Uh, we won't do a, a whole lot with uh, actually varying acceleration uh, specifically with time, but we will have periods where there are different accelerations, however, within the periods they're constant. We'll do a couple of those problems today too, but for the most part, uh, we have to be able to handle any possibility um, that comes our way. And very often, uh, and John, you probably saw some of this with that data you were looking at earlier, the acceleration uh, might not specifically be known as a function of time, but can be approximated with a function of time, and then from there we can use a lot of our the relations, relationships we are establishing as we uh, went through things. So we did look <coughs> at this first possibility that acceleration is a function of time, or is known as a function of time. This is the more common one we work with. Um, For obvious reasons, if you have some kind of uh, accelerometer, it's most likely that when it's running and when it's recording, it's recording as a function of time rather than as a function of position or velocity. So we had this possibility that there would be some function of time, whether it's known as actual data points or if the function itself is known, doesn't really matter. Um, either way, because the acceleration is the derivative of the velocity, then we know too that the change in velocity is the area under this curve between any two time periods. So that can be very useful to us if we want to go from one to the other. That between any two particular time periods, we can just take the area. Now if you have the acceleration, not as a nice function like this that's easy to integrate, but you have it as uh, discrete data points, you can still estimate the area under the curve by simply uh, calculating the area, actually looking at the graph and counting the squares underneath the area and using that as, as, a, as an approximation of the integration. Uh, not at all uncommon to do that sort of thing. In fact, there are software packages nowadays that will take discrete data points and approximate the area under there by that very method as they estimate what this area would be that we could then use that to find the uh, approximate uh, uh, change in velocity uh, from that area. Uh, we have, of course, the special case that the uh, functional relationship with uh, acceleration and time is such that the area is a constant, then simply uh, the integration of this then becomes that, uh, or the, der the, the derivative of that just becomes that A equals delta V over delta T. And so this becomes one of our constant acceleration equations. So that's, that's a, a very standard, very useful way to, to work through dynamics problems, uh, especially if you have some um, accelerometer that's recording the acceleration as a function of time as you go through things. Uh, I think the second possibility we looked at was that acceleration was a function of position. I think that's the order we did it. It's, it's not important what the order is, just as long as we get something out of it that we need. So if we have some, uh, some uh, known relationship between the acceleration and the position. Now this is something that might be a lot more likely you could do, uh, especially nowadays since every smartphone works like a GPS. Uh, and then most of them have accelerometers in them anyway. I know the iPhones have accelerometers in them. Uh, you can get 
a relationship between whatever acceleration you're seeing and where you happen to be instead. Uh, and that may come from the very same uh, data stream of the type of thing you were looking at today, John, with your, uh, your trip into school. Uh, but this is also the type of thing uh, you'd see in a constrained track of some kind, like a roller coaster ride where the accelerometer, the acceleration is very much a position function of where you happen to be on the uh, roller coaster ride and what happens to be going on at the time. But then we looked to at what the area under that represented. And uh, if I remember, <coughs> between any two particular time period, uh, times you need to look at the area under this was the change in the specific kinetic energy. Remember I used that term on Monday, the specific kinetic energy? That's a, a term you'll come across not so much in this class. Uh, in fact, I think this will be the only time you'll come across this term where the, the prefix specific is put on the front of something. It's very common in a class you'll take called uh, thermodynamics. Again, a, a dynamics course. Uh, we're interested in the change of state of things, in that case, the, the thermal change of state. This uh, prefix specific means nothing more than as uh, uh, per unit mass. <coughs> and if we take the kinetic energy that we remember and divide by the mass, we then get this term that we have here, we have the change in that specific kinetic energy. Uh, this just happens to be the, the kinetic energy, specific kinetic energy at one point. But this is a very common thing to do, to divide through by the mass to get the quantity you're discussing per unit mass. It's also fairly standard that when you do that, you then go from uppercase to lowercase for whatever the quantity is, so that it makes it easy to recognize. We won't worry about that in this class. This is the last time I, that I remember, that I recall, we'll see this type of thing. Uh, but when you get to thermodynamics, you'll do that kind of thing a lot, where you have a, a total quantity of some thermodynamic property, and if you divide through by the mass to get a mass per unit mass basis, then you go from uppercase to lowercase, and then uh, still talk about it a lot in that way. All right, so just for your future edification, and we had uh, we had that kind of thing. Um, <coughs> all right, then uh, we looked at the possibility again that that the acceleration could be constant, and we came up with our second constant acceleration equation uh, of that form. So there we now have two constant acceleration equations if you have a constant acceleration problem. Either of these two equations could apply to your problem depending upon what it is that you uh, what you have in the problem to work with. If you have the two velocities, the acceleration, and you're worried about the distance traveled, then that would certainly be the equation you use. And then we had the third possibility, acceleration as a function of velocity. This is very much the nature of fluid dynamic drag, that acceleration is some function of velocity. Uh, very often it's linear with velocity squared, even velocity cubed, depending upon the situation. So this is also a very uh, common form for us to uh, come across in, uh, in the real life study of the physics behind what we're doing. And if you remember, then that came to a relationship that looks something like that. And I requested that you remember that 
because uh, there will be times when we come across it and it's just not an obvious one. It's not one that you're more familiar with. We didn't come across this, this particular relationship in, in Physics 1. So you have to, uh, have to be careful with that. <coughs> but you don't forget it. Now, uh, that in particular led to these very same uh, constant acceleration equations that we had anyway. So it's not going to be of any great use to add anything more to those. <coughs> However, we did have the, oh, well, that's, that's not quite true. This one did lead to the constant acceleration equation, one-half a t squared plus v i t, if we left the delta t in there. Remember, we got to this by eliminating delta t from the problem, dt from the problem. If we leave it in there, then we can integrate the equation uh, to get that. So that's our third constant acceleration equation. And then, of course, there was a fourth constant acceleration equation that did not come from any one of these uh, standard uh, starting points. You may remember what it was, the fourth constant acceleration equation. Those of you who had me for Physics 1, You remember I told you you get these four equations tattooed somewhere, so you could always refer to them. Now would be a good time. V plus V naught over 2. The what? V plus V naught over 2 times the, It's using the fact that <coughs> the average velocity, which we know to be delta, te, delta S over delta T, um, the instantaneous velocity is ds dt, but the average velocity is delta s delta t, and you can arithmetically calculate the average velocity by taking the start velocity, the finish velocity, and dividing by two, as we would any, any mean calculation that we would do between two numbers. So we have those four constant acceleration equations at our beck and call as we need them. Alright, I think so there's there's a moderately quick summary of where we've gotten to on Monday. Looks sort of familiar from Physics 1, I hope. All right, so let's look at a problem. Um, one of the less common ones students aren't quite as used to, and that's this deal where we have an acceleration as a function of velocity. This is very common, as I said, in fluid dynamics problems, so it's very common. <coughs> when looking at something like a shock absorber or some kind of damped oscillator. They use this very fact um, to, to do the job they're supposed to do, which is to decrease the uh, acceleration of a problem by using the fact that uh, um, the acceleration can be a function of velocity. So if we have a piston in a cylinder, and that cylinder is filled with fluid and through the cylinder we have a couple small holes so uh, through, sorry through the piston we have a couple small holes so as the piston moves through the fluid depending on which way it's moving the fluid has to travel between those holes uh, as the piston moves up and down the cylinder since the drag force can be a function of velocity, then the acceleration, too, is a function of velocity. In fact, it's typically linear to the velocity itself, so we might have a relationship, something like that. Um, why minus sign?
Why am I in a sign? Drag causes the speed to decrease, resulting in negative acceleration. Drag is a friction force. It's always in the opposite direction the object is moving. So if, an ob if the piston as pictured happens to be moving to the right, the acceleration then is going to be to the left. It's going to cause the uh, piston to slow down. If it was moving at some speed, there's no force on it to maintain that speed. It's going to coast down to a stop because of the acceleration in the opposite direction it was moving. And that's exactly what a shock absorber is meant to do, or a, a damping. Uh, a dampener in an oscillating, oscillating system like your shock absorbers are. All right, so we have that set up there and uh, I'd like to do a couple things with it. So let's first express the velocity of it. We have the acceleration. Express the velocity as a function of time. We know the acceleration is a function of velocity. Let's figure it out as a function of time. Any recommendations? Any, any ideas of what we can do with that to, to get to that point? We have acceleration as a function of velocity. We want to find the velocity as a function of time. If we use our acceleration, our definition of acceleration, then we can link those very things. We have the acceleration as a function of velocity. We want to find the velocity as a function of time. So we can use this very uh, relationship that uh, we have right there. So moving it around a little bit. then we can integrate between some initial velocity it might have and then some later velocity it'll have uh, over some initial time period. We'll, we'll take the initial time to be zero, just to make things simpler, to some later time t when it achieves whatever this velocity might be. If we can complete this integration, then we'll have velocity as a function of time because we'll keep it sort of, sort of uh, open-ended at the top limit there. So this side integrates very easily. I'll do it so you can do the harder one. Joe's getting excited because he knows an integration's coming up. We know the acceleration. Um, is a fun, uh, hang on, we need something else here. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. We did that the wrong way. I, since the acceleration is a function of velocity, I need to collect that there. That's why things weren't going where I wanted them. Now, this will integrate between time zero and some time t, and now this between the velocities v0 and some later velocity v, whether it's uh, an increase or a decrease would depend upon a lot of the things going on in the system. All right, so this we can uh, integrate a little more, uh, a little more, <coughs> a little more tidy way. Sorry? There's supposed to be a k on z t. Uh, yes, because I brought the A down, yep. Actually, let's just put that K over there where it's easy to slip it in. All right. Because I brought the DT up, took the A down, and then integrated both sides. So this side integrates to K delta t. Actually, since the bottom limit is zero, just to minus kt. And then that side integrates to, who remembers offhand? The, yeah, the natural log between the two limits. 
And since they're subtracting and the, uh, the natural log, and then we put them back together, they'd be V0. Or in a more complete form to answer what we are looking for, the velocity is a function of time. That if we solve for the velocity as a function of time, we get V0 e to the minus kt. And what's that look like? on a VT graph. Starting at some initial velocity at time zero, then what does the speed do? And remember this is uh, the piston being unforced, undriven, just simply <coughs> coasting down at the, uh, uh, this acceleration where the acceleration is a function of velocity. Okay. Well, it'd be a decaying exponential curve. Looks something like that. the same starting point, let's express now the velocity as a function of time. No wait, sorry, we did that. What am I looking for? Oh, the, the position is a function of time. That makes more sense. Doesn't make any sense to do the same thing over again. Express the position as a function of time. All right, how are we going to manage that beast? And then uh, I'd also look to, like to see what it looks like, too, on a, an xt curve, where x is measured from some initial position <coughs> to some later position uh, as a function of time. We do have the velocity as a function of time, and we know then that <coughs> that's the derivative of the position with respect to time. So we can move it around a little bit, reintegrate, we'll integrate from 0 to x and from t to, from 0 to t, taking the initial time as 0 itself. And so we can integrate this. V0 e to the minus kt dt between the semi open and limits of 0 to t. Who's got that integral? to negative v naught over k between those limits. So uh, it just becomes then t. So our position, our, our change in position, but if we do it from t equals 0, we have then the change in position as a function of time. We saw the e to negative k t. Yeah. Oh. You can give me the whole integral. <coughs> yeah, so the, the inner, yeah, we have, it's like e to the u du. So we need then, uh, we have the t 
And then what part goes with it? Not. It's just the unit of KT minus, yeah, bring the extra. minus one. Um, B zero out in front. E to the minus KT, and then since it'll be to the zero power, just that. If a, if I have a negative. negative. What part? Whole thing over negative K. Oh, the whole thing over negative K. Uh, let's squeeze that in. B zero. We would have caught that looking at the units. Is that a little better? We okay? Yeah, that looks better. Okay. And so that with respect to time looks like, uh, assuming it starts at zero, then what does that look like? It'll reach some, or approach some maximum position, <coughs> something like that. All right, the last possibility is to put the two together where we have the express the uh, velocity as a function of uh, the position x. <coughs> Ideas of where to start on this one. We have acceleration as a function of velocity. We're looking for the velocity as a function of position. What? You didn't forget it? I told you to forget it. No, I told you you would forget it. Okay, we know uh, several of the pieces of this. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm using an x for position here. Though it's arbitrary, so we know this is k, v, dx equals v, dv. If we collect things a little bit so we can do the integration, we'll live, leave the, the k over with the dx and then put the v, dv over v. Well, that's certainly convenient. Then cancels out. And so then we can integrate that to get uh, uh, minus k delta x equals uh, delta v. And then that graph looks like Remember, at x equals 0, we have some initial velocity. <clears throat> and that velocity decreases as the piston moves because of the fluid drag. So it's going to be a decreasing function that looks like straight line. it's a straight line. It's a constant, minus k. Minus gives us the decrease. So it's going to look something like that. We could have also gotten that from the first two, uh, the one I already erased and the second one we got over there. If we just put those together and eliminated dt, we would have gotten the same thing. All right, any questions before I clear up? We'll, uh, we'll stop the tape here, getting a chance to reset my taper. Um, now we're going to go to sort of a quasi-constant acceleration problems. 
those where there's a, a, approximately a one acceleration in one time period and a different acceleration in a different time period. And we're going to go through these to try to uh, try to figure out what the different parts are that we don't have that need to go with that very same problem. So uh, a couple things we need to remember um, that I can't imagine you've possibly forgotten because uh, we've been doing it for years now since you started in physics one. But the velocity at any point is the slope of the position curve. And because of that as well, then the change in position is the area under the velocity time graph, if you happen to have it. That can be very useful to us. It's also true that at any point the acceleration is the slope of the velocity graph. And of course then the area under the velocity graph between any two points of interest is the area under the acceleration graph if you have that acceleration as a function of time. All right, so keep those in mind. Plus keep in mind the, the constant acceleration equations. This is always true. And then if acceleration is constant, then we have a couple other things that are true. That one just says if the acceleration is constant, then the acceleration always equals the average acceleration. And we have our other constant acceleration equations. Just rewriting what we had uh, a couple minutes ago in a less condensed form. And then the last one, everybody's favorite. We have those four constant acceleration equations. What? V1 should be squared, right? Uh, oh, yeah, V1 squared. We would have caught that looking at the units. The units wouldn't have worked out if we hadn't done that. Thank you, David. So we have those four constant acceleration equations. Uh, if you remember from uh, Physics 1, if you took it with me, I know we went over it this way. There's five possible variables in any constant acceleration equation. Uh, sorry, problem. And it's any of these five that show. Delta T, delta S, V1, V2, and A. Those are the only five possible variables in the constant acceleration problem. Notice that only four of them appear in any one of these equations. Whatever four constant acceleration, whatever four variables are part of the problem you're working on, <coughs> three of them you'll know, one of them you won't. That tells you which one of these equations. which one of these equations to use. Whatever four variables you've got in the problem, one of these equations has those four variables, and that's the equation you use. I remember taking this course, and well, physics one and this course, and just not understanding in the sample problems in the book how they knew which equation to use. They just started using one of the equations. And I finally realized if you lay it out this way, there's always four in any one problem. Three of them are known. One isn't. And that, those four tell you which one of the equations to use. All right. So let's, let's do a sample problem here. Imagine 
the position of a bicycle is known. It's very the same type of thing that John would have gotten off his uh, GPS software. As a function of time, and we'll we'll use uh, good standard American units of um, feet. And let's say it went something like this. Uh, after about 10 seconds, the bicycle had covered approximately 100 feet. And then at some time later, say 30 seconds, not about to scale, it had covered another portion of the distance such that position uh, was uh, varying in that regard and then was linearly changing thereafter. Actually, I need to fix this. This is why you should take notes in chalk. Need to bring my hundred down a little bit. There we go. So it looks something like that. So we have a, a curved section and then a linear section, and it reaches a distance of about 500 feet after 30 seconds. For that first section, uh, maybe we'll call it section A. The uh, position is uh, proportional to t squared. And then, of course, for the second section, it's linear which means it fits the form S equals MT plus B, which is the slope, and B is the y-intercept. So let's find for uh, each of these graph, find the graphs, well, we've already got the position graph, so let's find velocity as a function of time and acceleration as a function of time for these graphs. All right, uh, well, we know the velocity is DSDT. We're not going to be able to find that until we have this functional form of the two sections for for uh, the, the data that we have. For section A, how can we figure out what K is? Out what k is, then it's a fairly straightforward matter of it. differentiating it <coughs> once and then differentiating it twice to get the acceleration. How can we figure out what k is? Joe, you looked like you knew for a second. No? You need to figure out what k is. We also need to figure out what M and B are. We need to do this, but we need to do this separately because it's a different functional form for each section.
Any ideas? To find k, we can put any one of the data points in. Any data point that lies on the curve, we can put in here and solve for k. So, might as well put in that last data point, which is at, uh, right, 100 feet. It took 10 seconds to get there. And we can solve for k. Do it in your head. 10 squared in your head equals 100, so it's one. Any units on it? Well, if we have seconds in here and feet over here, this will be seconds squared. This had better be feet per second squared. Is that the acceleration? It might be. Certainly got the units for it. Is that the acceleration? Very, very simple for me to write down equals A, and I'm done with this part for section two. I'm sorry, for section A. It's the average acceleration, but not the. Well, uh, is this section a constant acceleration section? The position is a function of t squared. We Take the first derivative to get velocity, that'll be a function of t. The second derivative will be a function of t squared. Well, will just be a, the constant. The second derivative will get rid of the functional dependent amount of time. So it is constant acceleration <coughs> in this section. Is that this acceleration? Well, we don't have to guess. Let's, uh, let's take it a little farther now that we know this. Let's do this derivative. We don't need to guess. The equations will tell us what to do. We've got uh, uh, d dt of 1 foot per second squared t squared. I don't like writing it down without the units, even if it's a 1 out in front. Pretty easy one to derivate. Power comes down, reduce the power by one. Is that right? Two comes down, reduce the power by one, and we get two feet squared t. Is that the acceleration? Which one of these is the acceleration? Is it this? Is it that, or is it neither? Derivate. Derivate again. A equals dvdt. That will solve this problem once and for all for us. We got two feet per second squared t. That's an easy one to derivate. We get two feet per second squared as the acceleration. Why wasn't that the acceleration? Because the acceleration as defined by one equation is twice f of k. Well, we knew that when we got down to here. But if we're just looking at this, was there some way to tell that was not the acceleration, that it was only half the acceleration? Remember, we have a constant acceleration equation. 
that looks like this. Normally has VIT there, but our initial velocity is zero, so I just left it off. So whatever's out in front of the T squared, which is our K, is one half A. And so by the time we got to the bottom, it all agreed. So now we know the velocity and the acceleration for section A. Velocity is 2t squared with uh, all the positions and all the velocities being in English units. And the acceleration in section A is just the 2 feet per second squared. Let's keep Bad enough, you get sloppy with units. I don't have to do it too. Okay, so we get that then for section A. What about section B? Oh, yeah, it's the, it's the position is T squared. So that's just the T. Again, we would have caught that if we put numbers in with our units. All right, so that's section A. Where are we going to fit in section B? We've got the position. Well, we at least know it's linear. What we don't have is the slope and the intercept. How are we going to find those? Oh man, this, see, this is rough because you don't, you can't think back to calc for this. You can't think back to pre-calc for this. You've got to go back to pre-pre-calc for this, um. which. For me, it was 40 years ago. So I have an excuse, you don't. Um, B equals. Well, we could do the same thing we did before. Put in. How many data points will we need to use in this case? We'll need two. We have two unknowns. If we have two unknowns, we need two data points. Two known points. Well, we've got two. So we can put those in. Um, not to belabor the point because that's not the, the, the situation here. We can, you can pretty quickly come up with those. The slope you can get right off here in 20 seconds. It goes 400 feet. So that's what uh, 400 feet over 20 seconds, or 20 feet per second. T, and then I believe the intercept comes out to be a uh, 100, minus 100. Because if you take the intercept back, it hits there at about minus 100. And then real quickly, we can do what we need to do again. Deriverate those. Excited, enjoying, enjoying the reverberation too much. And so the acceleration is zero. zero. All right, let's do this. Let's plot the velocity as a function of time, uh, and then we can do the same thing for the acceleration as a function of time.
For section A, what's the velocity look like? For section A, it's linear with a slope of 2 and an intercept of 0. How far, how fast is it moving after that first 10 seconds? It'll be moving 20 feet per second. So we put the two sections together. Should look something like that. Is that jive? What's the acceleration graph look like then? It's 2x between 0 and 10 seconds. In section A, it's just the slope of the velocity curve, which is a constant. And is, uh, what do we have? 2. That's feet per second squared. And then? Zero. Then zero for the rest. Let me ask you this. What's that area represent? And can we double check it on any of the others to really make sure it all agrees? What's the area under a velocity time graph equal to? Distance. 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 Distance traveled between those same times. So this area is 10 times 20 times a half is 100. And that's how far it went during section A. This area, see another 20 seconds at 20 feet per second is another 400 feet, and it went another 400 feet in section B. So these graphs agree going up and down. Derivative coming down and the area going up. What's this area? Cool it, David. Okay. Take, 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 a, take, a, take break. a break. No problem. Kick back a little bit. Joe was saying, darn, he was doing great. What is that area equal to? Could be nothing. Just because we can take the area on their graph doesn't necessarily mean it means something. Does this area here represent anything. Phil, you're nodding your head. Change in velocity. Change in velocity between the same two time, same two times. Ten seconds at two feet per second, that area, the change of velocity is 20, and that's just what happens here. We get a change in velocity between there, the same thing. What about section B? Here's a tough one. What's the area under the graph for section B? Can you negative area. How about zero area, meaning the change of velocity was zero, and that's exactly what we saw there. <coughs> do these do these three graphs taken together look like something else you've studied in your recent past? Doesn't this isn't this exactly the way the shear moment diagrams go? That's the approach. The load, the shear, and the moment diagrams have exactly the same relationships as these ones do. All right. Uh, I'll let you do one a little bit, uh, see what you can put together for it. This time I'll start with the acceleration graph. You come up with the two other graphs the velocity and the position graph. <clears throat> yeah, it both don't look 
something like that. So here's the. Uh, for 10 seconds. We have an acceleration like that. 10 meters per second. Anytime we get numbers down, we better get units down as well. And then after 10 seconds, We have negative uh, acceleration. And well, let's let's say these are uh, test results for a car. In fact, we'll make it my car. There's my car. It looks like a car being drawn down the building since it's close to the acceleration due to gravity at first, and that's. <laughs> Better? You're, you're a bit of a realist sometimes, David. So, uh, so test results for a car. What does the velocity time graph look like? What does the position time graph look like? Just like in the shear moment diagrams, things change in the three graphs at the same time for each of them. And we'll just run this one out to some, some end time t, maybe we'll call it t prime, some end time t there. And uh, I don't know what that is. What is your acceleration when t is above 10 seconds again? At 10 seconds? It changes abruptly yeah, I don't, from I don't, that to that. Yeah, it's greater than 10 seconds. I, I don't see it labeled. Your lower line there. Oh, oh, I'm, oh the, quantum, the value for it. Yeah. All right, minus 2. Thank you. That's what you need. Yep. Too many things to think about. Way too many things to think about up here. I'm under all kinds of pressure. All right, and uh, I'll give you that it starts from a standing stop. And we'll measure things from there. And uh, that was its initial velocity. Works the same way our shear moment diagrams worked. And put numbers to these different important spots here uh, through the problem. And then Things like uh, total distance covered, final velocity, intermediate velocities, if you can come up with them, those kind of things. We got 
Tom. Alright, remember the acceleration is the slope of the velocity curve. So see if that gets you started on these pieces. Remember, one thing that's unknown is what this T prime is. See if uh, that piece of it can come into it. Phil, doing okay? Do we need our workometer? meter Where should I set it? You'd like. There's our work on meter. We're, we're, we're right about there, maybe? Sure. Travis, I think, is already done, so his work on meter is a little bit lower. Tom, that helps him? Yeah, a little bit there. All right, at the slope. Of the velocity curve is acceleration, the acceleration is 10 here, then we know the slope is 10 down here. And since the acceleration is constant, then the slope is constant. It's a straight line. And so let's see. Uh, What's that area represent? What does this area here represent? Change in velocity. Change in velocity. And we're starting from V to zero, so it'll be the final velocity after that time period. That area is 10 seconds by 10 meters per second. So we're going to end up at 100 meters per second at the end of that time period. Then what? Then what happens after that section? Decelerates, as we use in the common terminology, has negative acceleration. Slope is only minus 2. Until when? Yeah, tell t prime, but what do you think that is? Zero. t prime is zero? Yeah, it's, it's a test car. If we don't bring it back to a stop somewhere, we just let it keep going, we've lost a valuable piece of test equipment. So we can pretty well assume that it's going to come back to a stop and uh, the driver can get out of it. So that slope is 10 meters per second squared. This slope is minus 2 meters per second squared. What is that area? What is this area across here? Maybe it'd help if we call them section A and B again, like we did before. What's this area in section B represent? Change of velocity. Still represents change of velocity. The area under the acceleration curve between any two times is the change of velocity. How do these two areas compare? Maybe this is delta A, delta VA, delta VB for the two different sections. How do those two areas compare? They're equal. They've got to be equal. Whatever speed it picked up here, it's got to lose here to come to a stop. You can use that then to find out what T prime is. What is T prime? We have a 100, 
an area of 100 meters per second here, we need to have a hunt minus 100 meters per second here. It's a minus 2, so we need another delta t of 50 seconds. So we know that t prime then is 60 seconds because we started that time period at t. What about this second one? The work on me is going to have to go up for that part. What about this second graph? Velocity starts at zero. What's that tell us on the position graph? <coughs> no. The velocity is zero here. What does that mean slope. for us? The position it means the slope of the position graph. So we start at zero slope, and then steadily increase the slope to here. Then what happens? The slope steadily decreases back to zero. The only way we're going to be able to draw something like that is a curve that starts with its slope until it reaches zero again. We're going to have something like that. Remember that the Second derivative of a curve tells you its curvature. The acceleration is the second derivative, so it tells us the curvature of the position graph. Acceleration is positive, curvature is up. Acceleration is negative, curvature is down. So, what is the final distance then traveled? How can we figure that out? David, I told you to take a break. My apologies. Don't make me send you to the principal. How can we fairly easily figure out what this position is? Find the area under the velocity. Yeah. The total area under the velocity curve. Is delta s. So that's one half of ten, that's five hundred, and one half of fifty times a hundred, that's what, twenty-five, twenty-five hundred, five hundred plus twenty-five hundred, three thousand. Total distance of about three thousand meters. There's other ways to find that. That's probably as easy as anything. Just calculate the area under two triangular, triangular shapes. All right, last little thing. Your get out of class question and the weekend starts. from that sign a car might as well make it my car traveling on the ground thank you David caught that has a velocity of 15 meters per second If the acceleration is 4 meters per second squared, find, and you get 4 minutes. I'll only make you find one thing, otherwise you'll never get out early. Find the position from town 
at two seconds. Assuming that acceleration is constant. And that's your get out of class question. You get it, you get door to it. You don't get it, you stay here for the weekend. from town it is. Got it, Chris? You want to go early? Or you want to, yeah. All right, let's see. That's not what I had. And I never do anything wrong, as we know this on tape. Double check that. Remember, I'm asking you how far from town it is. So your number doesn't make any sense, Chris. Started 500 meters from town. From there, with that velocity at that point, that acceleration at that point, where does it end up two seconds later? acceleration, and time. Which equation has those four things in it? Change in position, velocity, acceleration, and time. One half a t squared plus b one t. So the initial position is 500 meters plus one half the acceleration, four meters per second squared, times two seconds squared. What's that? That's uh, one half. That's eight times four is thirty-two. And you guys had thirty-eight. Thirty-eight. That's two squared. And then the initial velocity. Oh, I had one here. We're saying zero there. Yeah. Plus. 15 meters per second plus two seconds. And that's 538? Yeah. You sure? 
I noticed when you multiply the, uh, I multi when you multiply I'll the buy. acceleration, you did multiply it by 0.5, you multiply it by 2. What acceleration by 0.5? Uh, 4 meters per second squared. Yeah. Here? Yeah, 4 times 4. Oh, in my head? Yeah. Yeah, but that's still, see, I have, I have like 740 meters. Wow. So. That's fast. I've, yeah. Well, it's, 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 that's the, the nature of a little red sports car. So I don't know. I don't know what that is. So, all right. Uh, here's what we'll do. Next week, I'll let you go two minutes early.